Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for the launch of the report, The Supply of Medical Isotopes and Economic Diagnosis and Possible Solutions. Opening remarks today will be made by Mr. William D. Magwood IV, NEA Director General, and Mark Pearson, who's Deputy Director of the OECD Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs. These will be followed by a presentation of the report from Martin Wenzel, who is a Health Policy Analyst in the OECD Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs. And later on, we will take questions from the audience, both here and online. Our panel will then do their best to answer them, given that the co-author of the report, Kevin Charlton, unfortunately could not be with us today. Today's moderator is Professor Jan Hos Kepler, Senior Economic Advisor at the NEA. For instructions on how to submit your questions, please visit the NEA website at www.oecd-nea.org or send them directly to press at oecd-nea.org. Jan, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrew. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar for the launch of the report by the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, the NEA, and the OECD Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs, the OECD ELS. And uh, the report is the supply of medical isotopes and economic diagnosis and possible solutions. My name is Jan Hos Kepler. I'm Senior Economic Advisor in the NEA Division on Nuclear Technology Development and Economics. That division has produced a report together with the Health Division of the OECD ELS. With me are Martin Wenzel of the OECD ELS Health Division, one of the two authors of the report, as well as Mark Pearson, Deputy Director of the OECD Directorate for Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs. Martin, Mark, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Second author of the report, as has been mentioned, Kevin Charlton of the NEA NTE Division, can unfortunately not be with us this afternoon. However, he will be watching us and has been closely involved in the preparations. Our event this afternoon will proceed as follows. We are fortunate to be able to start with a video address by the Director General of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, uh, Mr. William D. Magwood. Following Bill Magwood's address, Mark Pearson will make a number of introductory remarks for the OECD ELS. We will then proceed to a presentation of the main findings of the report, the supply of medical radioisotopes, the economic diagnosis and possible solutions by Martin, Martin Wenzel. I will then very briefly present the accompanying technical report on uh, the 2019 medical isotope demand and capacity projections for the 2019-2024 period. And then it will be your turn uh, as we will open both the floor and the internet, as Andrew has said, for questions to Martin, Mark, and myself on the supply of medical radioisotopes. With no further ado, let us now turn to the video address by Mr. Magwood. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Magwood. I'm Director General of the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, introducing a very important new report that's jointly issued by the NEA and also OECD Health Division, which is entitled The Supply of Medical Radioisotopes and Economic Diagnosis and Possible Solutions. As many of you know, the use of nuclear materials in medicine is something that is both very important and also not well understood by the public in general. Most people don't know that when they go to the hospital for a diagnosis that they're going to be encountering radiological materials or processes in some way to either diagnose or treat their sickness. These isotopes are very important in the wide range of treatments, but there's no isotope that's more important than technetium 99M. Technetium 99M is used in the diagnosis of a wide range of maladies, particularly important in the use of the diagnostic techniques to look at soft tissue and the nervous system in areas that are inaccessible uh, using x-rays or other diagnostic tools. This isotope is so important that it's used about 30 million times each year around the world to diagnose cancer and many other maladies. So it was very disturbing years ago when we discovered that there was a shortage of this isotope, that patients were actually told that they either could not be diagnosed or they'd have to use some alternative that often included exploratory surgery. This is unacceptable. And our member countries found it unacceptable as well. Led by the government of Canada, under the auspices of the NEA, 
countries formed a group that became known as a high-level group of medical radioisotopes. This group proved to be extraordinarily important and extraordinarily successful. It brought together the whole community, not just the government sector, but also the industrial sector, the research community, and the health community to talk about how to make sure that these shortages never happen again. The high-level group brought together experts from around the world to talk about how do we establish a market for radioisotopes? How do we have an economic basis to make sure these isotopes are produced successfully? And what we found is that around the world, the government still subsidized the production of isotopes, one way or another. And as commercial companies come into this market, they are finding it's very, very difficult to make a profit, be successful, and stay in operation under the current circumstances. Now this is understandable because isotopes themselves came from government operations where at the time where the government was more interested in operating reactors and other facilities for either national security purposes or research purposes, and isotopes were simply a spin-off, a side benefit to those operations. Today, the isotopes are the main event. The isotopes are what are most important and of interest to countries around the world, and in order to make sure that there's a stable supply, we have to have a stable market. That's what the high-level group is focused on. So it brought the whole community together to look at the economics of this, of this system, to find ways of making sure that it was possible to get full cost recovery for the production of isotopes so the suppliers could stay in business and continue to provide a very stable supply to hospitals around the world. The high level group has been extraordinarily successful. We're very pleased with the results of it. And as it's moving towards the end of its tenure, uh, we're very pleased also to bring in our friends from OECD Health Division. Uh, these are people who have expertise in the overall healthcare system. So marrying the nuclear expertise with the healthcare expertise has enabled this report to go forward. So we're very pleased to have you here today to talk with us about this and to ask questions about this report and what the next steps may be in the future as current countries respond to the very important need to assure the availability of Technetium 99M. This report will cover the European Union, Switzerland, the United States, Japan, Canada, really all the countries that have the most reliance on this isotope to understand what the environment is and how to be successful in the future. So please um, listen to the presentations that are coming up and be prepared to ask very difficult questions to these experts because that's what they're here for. So we appreciate your participation in this webinar and look forward to working with you, the broad community, OECD Health Division, and many others to make sure that important medical isotopes are available to patients around the world without interruption. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Yes, uh, very good. Uh, Mark, what has been the view of the OECD ELS on that report? Great. Well, thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you, Bill. And thank you to the NEA for inviting us here today to talk about this report, which we very much enjoyed uh, working with the NEA to prepare. Um, Bill's already introduced the high-level group, uh, of course. And that group uh, invited the OECD Health Committee to conduct a study that looks at the need for medical uh, radioisotopes in national health systems and anal analyzes the current market structure. And the goal of this work really was to identify barriers to implementation of full cost recovery, which as many of you know, uh, full cost recovery in the production supply of medical radioisotopes was the first of the principles in the framework developed by the high level, high level group. Uh, and in particular, the studies looked at whether healthcare provider payments for nuclear medicine diagnostic scans have been a barrier preventing full cost recovery. So this report really is an answer to that question that the, the high level group posed to us. Uh, before saying a little bit about that report, uh, I would like to thank the NEA again, and in particular Kevin Charlton, who co-authored the report, but also to the high level group, of course, for supporting the work that's been done, but also the, the delegates to the OECD Health Committee who, and the respondents to an OECD survey on healthcare provider payments for nuclear medicine diagnostic services uh, on which the report is based. And I also want to, to thank the uh, 
DG Joint Research Centre of the European Commission, which funded a study on sustainable and resilient supply of medical radioisotopes in the European Union. So enough of the introduction. Let me say a little bit about what's in the report. Uh, first of all, obvious point, but we need to make it, that nuclear medicine diagnostics are and continue to be essential for accurate diagnoses of many diseases which are a big burden on the societies in OECD countries. And technetium-99 is the most commonly used radioisotope in nuclear medicine diagnostic scans. It's used, in fact, in about 85% of all nuclear medicine diagnostic scans worldwide. And as Bill's already said, that's about 30 million scans every year. And these scans are performed on virtually all parts of the human body, in particular the skeleton, bone marrow, heart, and human brain. And they're necessary for the accurate diagnosis of things like cancer, uh, ischemic heart disease, neurological disorders, including dementia, and movement disorders. Now, it is true in some areas, substitution of technetium-99 is clinically possible, uh, notably for cardiac and bone scans, uh, which are a large share of all technetium-99-based scans. And here we're talking about alternatives such as positron emission tomography, PET scans, uh, commuted computed tomography, CT scans, and magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI scans. They're all, they're all alternatives. However, even in these cases, substitution would be costly. Not only are these alternative scans more expensive to conduct than a technetium 99-based scan, substitution would also require a significant long-term investment in alternative scanning equipment and human resources. There's currently insufficient equipment and a lack of trained personnel to increase substantially the use of alternative imaging modalities. So if we go down that route, we'll need a long lead time. In other areas, there are, however, no comparable substitutes for technetium-99. And these include for really important diseases, breast cancer, melanoma, sentinel lymph node, lymph node studies to detect head and neck cancer, and a range of diagnostics for children, in particular for pediatric bone and renal scans. There's also a number of areas where TC-based scans are just better than the alternatives. Um, so the alternatives exist, but they're just not as good for things like whole body bone scans to screen for cancer. So a reliable supply of technetium-99 is, continues to be, essential for effective patient care in OECD countries and beyond. Yet, despite some improvements, not least as a result of the work by the high-level group, governments of countries that host the nuclear research reactors required for producing technetium-99 continue to subsidize production and supply continues to be unstable. Now, our report finds that healthcare provider payments you know, it is a relevant factor in the economics of the supply chain of technetium-99, especially in countries where payments aren't responsive to a change in provider costs. However, it is not the main barrier to full cost recovery. Price increases need to be driven by the supply chain, and this is where policy needs to intervene. And the report suggests a number of possible starting points to help overcome these barriers. These range from funding of production by governments of end-user countries right the way through to a withdrawal of government funding and accompanying measures to catalyze price increases. And we'll present these, Martin will present these briefly in today's meeting. But I would say even now, we are not recommending a solution at the moment, not a single solution. Clearly cooperation, further cooperation between governments of producing countries and supply chain participants is needed to coordinate further efforts in order to identify the solutions that work best in local contexts. And with that, I would like to set, hand it back to you, Jan, and then on to Martin to present the report. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mark, for these uh, introductory uh, remarks that uh, uh, fairly well frame uh, what is going to happen next, which will be the highlight and the main part of our webinar which is a pre presentation of the report by Martin Wenzel, one of the two co-authors. Martin.
So first of all, thank you very much uh, to the Nuclear Energy Agency for hosting this event and uh, for having us here. My name is Martin Wenzel. Um, as was said already, I'm one of the two uh, main co-authors of the report titled uh, The Supply <coughs> of Medical Radioisotopes and Economic Diagnosis and Possible Solutions. So I, what I will do um, for the next half hour or so is run through um, the main parts of the report and, and um, uh, present uh, some of the main takeaways. Unfortunately, my main co-author from the Nuclear Energy Agency, Kevin Charlton, um, couldn't be here today, which is, um, of course, unfortunate because he wrote the section, or he was in charge of the section uh, that analyzes the supply chain, which I suspect will be of interest to many participants, but we'll be, do our best um, to answer uh, questions. Uh, before going into the details, uh, this is the main out this is the outline of, of our report and at the same time of this presentation, uh, the report contains five main chapters. The first one uh, provides an overview of the use of technetium 99 in healthcare, which was written um, by an external consultant uh, from Canada who is a specialist in uh, um, uh, radiological diagnostics and nuclear medicine. Second, we're looking at variations um, in the use of technetium-99 across OECD countries. Uh, we then, in the third section, look in quite some detail at healthcare provider payment for nuclear medicine diagnostic scans, which of course, um, as Mark pointed out, was one of the main reasons that the high-level group asked us uh, to, to look at this subject. Um, the fourth section um, provides an analysis of the supply chain. That was the focus of the work uh, by the Nuclear Energy Agency and Kevin Charlton, who is not with us here today. And then finally, um, the uh, report puts forward a number of policy options that could potentially help to increase the reliability of technetium-99 uh, supply going forward. Just a few words on the scope of or the focus of the report. Um, it is titled The Supply of Medical uh, Radioisotopes, but it focuses really only on diagnostic scans that use technetium-99 and therefore the technetium-99 and the molybdenum uh, supply chain. And in terms of geography, um, it covers the European or countries that are members of the European Union and the OECD. Uh, we cooperated with uh, the Director General uh, Joint Research Center of the European Commission uh, for parts of the report. And we also include, um, in addition to uh, Switzerland, the four largest non-European countries, um, the largest uh, mar markets outside of Europe uh, that consume technetium-99, which are Australia, Canada, Japan, and the United States. Um, so with that, uh, the starting point of our report really is uh, uh, the patient, um, and the report laid out, lays out in quite some detail the clinical uses of nuclear medicine di diagnostics that rely on technetium-99, breaking activity down uh, by the main organ systems or anatomical areas of the human body. So this figure tries to illustrate that uh, technetium-based scans are used in nearly all parts of the human body, as Mark uh, already pointed out in the introduction. Uh, technetium pro is a product that is essential to diagnosis and therefore appropriate treatment uh, for a wide range of disease diseases. Alternative diagnostic mo modalities include computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, and ultrasound, as well as other uh, nuclear medicine uh, diagnostic scans, such as uh, positron emission tomography, PET scans that rely um, on other medical radioisotopes. The report lays out in some detail um, the diagnostic uh, purposes for which technetium-99 um, are used, and also the areas in which technetium-99 uh, can be substituted with alternatives. This is, of course, one of the key questions that need to be answered um, if we want to understand um, whether price, uh, whether, uh, price um, increases in the supply chain can be absorbed by healthcare providers or not, whether alternatives are available. I'm not going to go through um, all uh, the, the examples where technetium can be uh, substituted. As I said, uh, this was written by someone um, with expertise in, in, uh, with more expertise in, in uh, nuclear medicine. But by way of example here, uh, this table tries to show uh, two uh, specific uh, areas where substitution is possible. Uh, so for some types of time, type of bone scans, for instance, uh, which represent a large proportion of all technetium-99 based scans. Um, technetium can be substituted uh, with either positron um, emission tomography or um, with scans that use thallium-201. Uh, 
PET scans in this case can even have uh, the advantage of a superior uh, diagnostic performance, but at the same time, uh, the main barrier to actually achieving uh, such substitution is the currently limited uh, infrastructure um, of PET scanners um, that could not abs absorb the additional volume uh, that would be necessary to sub substitute for technetium-99. Um, as Marco also pointed out in the introduction, a substitution is not always possible. Um, there are a number of clinical areas um, where there is a, a lack um, of alternatives. One example is whole body scanning to detect cancer. Another one um, would be the, diagno the diagnosis of specific cancers such as breast cancer, head and neck cancer, and melanoma. Um, and as Marco also pointed out, um, some studies in children, in particular um, pediatric bone and renal scans, um, cannot be substituted. Illustrating uh, that substitutability may also vary quite significantly between uh, different countries that are uh, covered in our report, uh, this figure tries to illustrate um, or shows the breakdown um, of the, the total number of technetium based scans by organ systems. It only shows this for six countries where such data was available, um, as we found in our research. What it does show is that um, collectively, uh, bone and cardiac scans represent between 45 and 75 percent of all scans, but that there are a number of uh, particularities uh, across countries and that um, uh, there is quite significant variation. So we see, for instance, in Germany, thyroid scans uh, represent more than 40 percent of the total volume of scans, while, the thyroid, while thyroid scans represent less than 10 percent um, in all other countries where uh, uh, data available. In Japan, bone scans represent more than half um, of the total, and neurological scans uh, represent 12%, which is significantly more uh, than in all the other countries. And in the United States, we also see a, a particularity in that 55% um, of the total are cardiac scans, which is a lot more um, than in, in any of the other countries. Um, there is also significant variation across countries um, in the rates um, of, of all uh, technetium-based scans relative to the population. Uh, this figure uh, shows the rate of scans conducted each year per thousand population in uh, uh, the 27 countries that were in the initial scope of our, of our research. It shows that variation is indeed quite, quite staggering. Um, we see that in countries with the lowest rates, such in the Baltics, for instance, or in Poland, as few as two scans uh, per thousand population um, per year are performed, while at the other end of the range here on the left-hand side of the chart, we see that um, more than 30 uh, such scans are performed in, the, in countries like the United States um, and in Belgium, and that this number is estimated to be as high as 50 scans per thousand population a year in Canada. Um, while the reasons for this variation are not explored in our report and could really be um, a, subject for a, a subject for a separate piece of research, um, it also means that uh, countries with large populations or with high scan rates represent a large a proportion of the total uh, world market for technetium. The same data um, uh, that we collated from various sources suggests that across the 27 countries that we looked at, about 20 uh, million uh, technetium-based scans are performed each year, which is about two-thirds um, of, the, of the global world market. And about 50% of these, so um, uh, 10 million, take place in the United States, here on the left-hand side of the chart. The next nine countries, if we rank them um, uh, according to the absolute number of scans performed every year, represent another 43% um, of the total activity, which means that um, the top 10 collectively represent more than 90% um, of all scanning that uh, goes on um, uh, every year. Um, and for this reason, the parts of our report uh, that talk about um, uh, the use of technetium-99 and the related aspects of health um, systems, in particular healthcare provider payment, focuses on these large markets. Um, we conducted a survey for that uh, purpose, um, and the chapter that specifically looks at healthcare provider payment uh, covers eight um, of the top 10 countries. We were not able to cover Italy and Spain, uh, which are two of the uh, top 10 countries. 
So I will now move into um, uh, some details um, on healthcare provider payment for nuclear medicine diagnostic scans. Uh, the first thing to look at are the different healthcare provider types that provide services. This table shows uh, which types um, of providers are providers of nuclear medicine diagnostics in the countries that responded to our survey. Uh, 17 countries responded. Uh, we added the United States, which as I pointed out um, on the previous slide is of course the largest uh, market in the OECD. And we see from this table that across all um, of these 18 countries, hospitals uh, provide nuclear medicine diagnostic services. In seven out of 18 countries, office-based specialists also provide serv services. And in 11 um, out of 18 countries, uh, there are other outpatient-only providers, so institutions such as um, uh, radiological clinics or diagnostic centers that provide services. This distinction is important because um, some provider types, such as hospitals, are, of course, much larger than, uh, than others, such as office-based uh, specialists. Their cost structures, their revenue structures differ, as do the payment systems or the payment mechanisms that, that healthcare payers use uh, to remunerate uh, healthcare providers for their services, which then creates or can create quite different financial incentives uh, for providers. And this brings me into a, a, a high-level in, uh, um, introduction into uh, the main payment me mechanisms that are used for nuclear medicine diagnostic services. There are three uh, different types. First, there is fee-for-service, whereby a predetermined price is, pre is uh, paid for a predetermined unit of service. And the unit of service is usually defined quite narrowly, such a specific scan um, of an organ system using um, a specific scanning modality um, or a specific product such as Technetium 99. Second, there are case-based payments, um, often also referred to as diagnosis-related groups or DRGs. Uh, DRGs also uh, are also based on predetermined um, amounts that are paid to providers, but they cover a broader bundle of services that are associated with a given diagnosis and have a relatively homogeneous um, level of resource use. They are typically used to pay hospitals for an entire uh, patient stay. The groupings and payments uh, that are used for DRGs are usually also set prospectively, um, and they are usually based on hospital data um, um, and actual um, hospital costs, average hospital costs um, for these services. And then third, uh, there are global budgets, uh, which are prospective lump sums that cover a wide range of activity and a time period and are independent of the actual volume um, of services provided, which means that a hospital, for instance, receives a certain budget for a certain period and then needs to fund all activity from that budget, regardless of the number of um, uh, scans or the number of other uh, services that are actually provided. All of these three mechanisms have in common that, they, that the payment rates are set up front. So with some small exceptions, payers don't usually ac actually reimburse um, healthcare providers for their costs. They set uh, prices up front, and uh, providers then receive um, uh, these amounts. A big difference between uh, fee-for-service payments and DRG payments is that uh, fee-for-service or DRG payments are in some way related to actual cost data, um, and they somehow usually reflect the relative costs of services. Global budgets usually uh, don't take into account uh, past uh, cost data or any detailed cost projections. This also means that uh, providers bear some financial risk. Um, the risk they bear increases with the degree of bundling, which means that fee-for-service um, uh, places the lowest risk um, on healthcare providers. Providers only have financial risk with respect to the resources that they use for each service provided, because each additional service they provide will attract additional uh, payment. DRGs play, place higher risk um, on, on providers, um, and they incentivize providers to use resources efficiently within um, each, each DRG, because any additional service that they provide within um, uh, that grouping will act not actually attract an additional payment. And then a global budget, as I pointed out already, um, places the highest uh, level of risk on, on healthcare providers, because additional services never attract um, additional payments. Putting um, these uh, payment uh, mechanisms together uh, with the uh, provider types that provide nuclear medicine diagnostic scans, showed on, on the previous slides. Uh, we see that specialist offices and other provider types that only provide outpatient services are typically um, uh, paid 
or are almost exclusively paid uh, fee for service. That is, they get they are paid as a, a, a given a sum for uh, every scan that they deliver. While for hospitals, uh, payment mechanisms vary. Uh, with inpatient activity is usually usually being funded from global budgets or uh, DRGs, um, and fee for service payments also only apply to outpatient services in some cases. The United States here is a special case compared to all the other countries because um, there are many different uh, payers for healthcare and healthcare uh, payment mechanisms are specific to each of the payers. Um, to provide an example um, of, of what this means in practice, um, uh, this is England. Um, in England, uh, there is a national health service. Um, outpatient scans or Nearly all um, nuclear medicine services uh, provided in, in England are provided by um, hospitals um, of the NHS on an outpatient basis. Uh, these services are paid on a fee-for-service uh, basis according to a national uh, fee schedule that currently contains 49 billing codes, locally referred to as healthcare resource groups or HRGs. Um, each of these codes is associated with a predetermined base payment which is updated once every two years based on actual um, hospital cost data that is submitted uh, to a central authority. Uh, to determine the final payment uh, that a hospital receives, uh, the base amounts are adjusted for geographical differences um, in the cost of production factors. This is an adjustment uh, that is referred to as uh, the market forces uh, factor adjustment. So a hospital in a rural area, for instance, such as Cornwall, might only receive the base um, amount while a hospital in central London, uh, where the cost um, of, of hiring staff and so on is, is expected to be higher, can receive up to 1.3 times uh, that base amount. The base amounts in the current fee schedules range from uh, about 130 uh, uh, pounds sterling for a simple spec scan uh, to as much as 380 um, uh, pounds sterling for an infection scan. For the most common scans, as we've seen, which are bones, bone and cardiac scans, they are between 130 and 190 uh, British pounds. In England, there are no separate, as in, in most countries, there are no separate payments to cover specifically the cost of technetium. So hospitals fund the cost of technetium from these uh, payments that they receive for the entire service. Across the countries that the report uh, looks at, uh, there are four countries where providers do receive a separate payment uh, for Technetium 99 on top of the payments that they may receive through the fee-for-service, through DRGs or through global uh, budgets. The four are here up on the slide. One of them is Belgium, where hospitals provide services and they all uh, receive a fixed amount per scan for the cost of Technetium 99. Um, and were applicable also for the cold kit that is used together um, with Technetium 99. Since 2015, the payment rate has been unchanged, and it has been um, 18 euros and 60 cents for each scan um, for the Technetium uh, consumed, and the same amount uh, for the cold kit where it is used. In Japan, all providers receive fee-for-service payments according to a national uh, fee schedule and an additional unbundled payment that is specific to each technetium product uh, that is on the market and also specific uh, to each manufacturer. Prices are either defined by patient dose or by the amount of radioactivity delivered um, and they are usually realigned once every two years in the biannual revision of the national fee schedule by the Ministry of Health. In Germany, um, outpatient providers that are paid based on the national uniform fee schedule, receive unbundled payments for material costs, including for technetium. In the 2018 version um, of the schedule, uh, these ranged from beyond euro 50 for a simple thyroid scan to up to 380 euros uh, for technetium labeled antibodies. This only applies to um, outpatient specialists that receive a fee-for-service payment according to this national um, uh, fee schedule for hospitals, um, uh, all payments are included in, in, in DRGs. And in the United States, as I said already, the United States is difficult to summarize because there, there is a fragmented payer landscape. But Medicare, which is the largest publicly funded health coverage scheme that provides coverage for um, the population older than 65 years, pays a specialist offices a cost-based reimbursement um, uh, for Technetium 99 and also makes an add-on payment of 10 US dollars um, to hospital out for hospital outpatient services for um, Technetium 99 produced from non-high 
enriched uranium sources. In all other countries um, and for all other provider types, except the four listed up here, um, the payments, uh, the fee-for-service payments, DRG payments or global budgets also cover the cost of technetium. So as I um, said at the beginning, our report also contains a structural analysis of the supply chain. Um, starting with uh, the patient um, at the uh, provider institution and then working backwards. So we see uh, the patient and the provider institution here on the left-hand side um, of, of this figure and then working backwards um, upstream uh, through the supply chain to analyze the markets um, along the supply chain at the step of nuclear pharmacies, at the step of generator manufacturing, at the step of processing, and finally at the step of nuclear research reactors that irradiate the uranium targets. I will not go into much detail um, on this because this has been the focus by, uh, of, of our colleagues here at the Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, but suffice to say that the markets along this supply chain are relatively complex um, and they are far from uh, perfectly competitive markets. So as we have seen, um, in many countries, the prices of patient scans are set centrally uh, by public health care payers, um, while they can be provided either in a public uh, provider setting or pri by private providers such as office-based specialists. And, but they are usually fixed um, uh, for a, a certain period of time and then revised uh, periodically. Nuclear pharmacies are either integrated, depending on the country, with larger healthcare provider um, organizations, or they can also operate um, as private and profit-making businesses that compete with each other. Generator manufacturers uh, tend to be large private businesses that compete globally, so they are, are, can be large um, uh, pharmaceutical companies or relatively specialized uh, pharmaceutical companies that engage mainly in generator manufacturing. And then as we move further upstream, um, the, the public sector starts playing a more important uh, 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 role again, but there are still um, high en en uh, entry barriers to markets because of regulation and because of uh, production that is highly capital intensive at the processing and, and nuclear research reactor step. Uh, so both processes and nuclear research reactors receive government funding uh, to varying exten extents. That is also uh, laid out in quite some detail in, an, in our report. Um, and in this part of the supply chain, um, or indeed in, in, in all parts of the supply chain going uh, backwards from uh, nuclear pharmacies, um, supply chain participants can also enjoy market power. So for instance, the largest three reactors um, uh, supply more than 50% um, of the global market for irradiation, um, and the uh, three largest uh, generator manufacturers um, have a combined market share that is um, even higher. There are also some information asymmetries, or if information generally is a, is a problem in the supply chain um, between market players uh, that, of course, uh, know, um, uh, have all the information about their cost structures, about their uh, commercial strategies, and then the public sector uh, that aims to regulate the market uh, that has um, much poorer information. We know very little, even after um, the work that has been done by the high-level group, on the cost structures and product prices, uh, for instance, generator uh, prices are usually negotiated between gener generator manufacturers um, and um, purchases, in the purchases in the healthcare sector, um, and they are typically uh, confidential. Um, so the Nuclear Energy Agency also produced estimates of the total market value um, at, the th at three main steps of the supply chain, at the point of generator delivery, sale of bulk, bulk moly uh, by processes and at the uh, irradiation step. Uh, this was based on prior work by the high-level group, um, information that is publicly available in financial reports and a number of assumptions. They estimate that the global market for generators is worth about 630 million US dollars annually, which would suggest assuming uh, 30 million patient doses uh, produced every year, an average cost of a patient dose of about 21 US dollars. The bulk moly market um, is estimated to, to be worth uh, two, 230 million US dollars uh, uh, globally every year. And the market for irradiation services um, is estimated to be worth less than 60 million uh, US dollars, suggesting that um, eight US dollars um, of each patient dose is associated with the supply of bulk moly and less than two um, US dollars with irradiation by nuclear research reactors. It's, so of course, important to point out that these estimates are averages based on 
on high-level assumptions. The true cost um, of patient doses can be assumed to vary quite significantly around these averages. Uh, they probably differ by type of scan that is performed because the different amounts of product are used. They vary because, dif because of different distribution models, different practices at nuclear pharmacies of eluting uh, generators and therefore varying um, uh, decay loss. And also uh, the prices of generators uh, vary across many factors. Um, so we can put these estimates uh, into perspective uh, given what we know about healthcare provider payment and what we know about, about uh, from, from work by the high level group um, of how much would be necessary, uh, how much of a price increase would be necessary to achieve full cost recovery. recovery. So assuming that the cost associated with irradiation in each patient dose is on average two US dollars and that based on the most recent uh, self-assessment reports produced by the high level group, um, irradiation prices would have to increase by another 40% to achieve full cost recovery. This would imply that the price of an average patient dose would have to increase by only about one US dollar uh, to in achieve full cost recovery. This can be compared uh, to payments that are made to healthcare providers for diagnostic scans. Um, as I said, the report provides a lot of detailed information on this. Uh, where providers are paid fee-for-service, um, a few examples up here on, on the slide. Uh, the simplest scans can attract payments that are as low as 50 US dollars, for instance, for a dynamic blood flow st study in Australia or for a thyroid scan in Germany, while uh, the more complex scans um, uh, can be paid up to $600, such as a pulmonary, pulmonary ventilation scan in France or an adrenal study um, in Australia. Um, for hospitals, uh, DRGs that uh, cover entire patient stays can attract payments of several thousand dollars. Um, two examples up here um, from Germany uh, where patient stays uh, related to, to breast cancer that are expected to include a nuclear medicine diagno diagnostic uh, procedure uh, uh, can attract payments of up to 5,000 or 6,000 uh, US dollar. So these numbers uh, seem to confirm prior um, assumptions in the high-level group that technetium represents a relatively small cost item in the overall cost and revenue structure of nuclear medicine providers, and that the price increases that are necessary for full cost recovery currently would also be small uh, compared to the overall cost of scans. Um, so perhaps exceptions uh, to this may, might be very small and specialized providers, so in particularly office-based specialists, in, and, and in particularly in scenarios where payments are already insufficient to cover current costs or have not been um, updated for a number of years. Uh, we've seen in Belgium, for instance, there's a, a payment that is specific to technetium that has been the same since 2015, so this might be an area where uh, that needs to be looked at. Uh, we also know from our sur survey that in Australia, um, payments have been frozen uh, for nearly 10 years, or in France, payments have declined over time. But in general, um, as we, our report tries to show, um, healthcare provider payment, payment mechanisms consider actual provider costs when setting payment rates. Um, payment by, by diagnosis-related groups are usually based on cost accounting data, and fee-for-service payments are typically renegotiated uh, periodically so that any cost increase um, uh, can be passed on uh, to payers. So because healthcare provider payment is reactive to, to provider costs, our report concludes that uh, uh, the price increase necessary for technetium 1999 has to be driven by suppliers, so ultimately by general manufacturers or nuclear pharmacies. Healthcare providers will only increase, um, uh, healthcare payers will only increase provider payment if there is an appreciable increase in input costs that applies to all healthcare um, uh, providers equally. So this is also one of the main conclusions of our report, uh, that uh, the barriers to full cost recovery really lie within the supply chain. Um, what is important to note from the structural analysis of the supply chain is that there are competitive pressures uh, between the processing step and the and nuclear pharmacies or healthcare providers. Uh, generator manufacturers are for-profit businesses that complete glo compete globally, and in some countries also uh, nuclear pharmacy pharmacies. Some of the um, market players have market power, and processes also compete uh, from business from generator manufacturers, um, while nuclear research reactors at the end of the supply chain are uh, bound to processes that are geographically close because the product can only be transported by road. 
And these um, nuclear research reactors continue to be funded by governments, which means that uh, operations can be sustained um, in the current model, while individually uh, supply chain members, of course, have an, a disincentive to increase prices because this could um, entail a loss of business to, to uh, competitors. And at the same time, uh, for nuclear uh, research reactors, uh, they have an incentive to uh, sell irradiation services below full cost recovery um, levels uh, to use existing uh, capacity, and government funding um, allows that uh, to be sustained. So the report, um, to come uh, to a conclusion, the report puts forward a number of policy options that could help make the supply of, of uh, radioisotopes and ultimately the diagnostic scans that rely on them more stable. Um, there are seven options in total. The first four of them um, would aim to help catalyze price increases from within the current supply chain. The report first suggests that governments could identify uh, uh, the nuclear research reactor costs associated with irradiation for moly production and then withdraw funding um, of these over a predefined period and in coordination with other producing countries. This could be accompanied by measures that uh, would allow the supply chain to uh, adjust to this change, such as great uh, uh, price transparency or price regulation. A fifth option, an alternative, would be to continue government funding of moly production but agree with end-user countries uh, that end-user countries bear the cost um, um, of production rather than uh, producing countries. And finally, um, as mentioned already, there could be options to substitute away uh, from the use of, of technetium-99. Um, a bit of a disclaimer regarding the policy options presented in the report. Um, these op these uh, options are options, they're not recommendation recommendations. Each of them has a number of strengths and weaknesses that we try to point out in the report. Uh, the report deliberately took a health system perspective, which was the request um, of the high-level group. But what we find is, of course, that barriers um, uh, to full cost recovery are very much in the supply chain, um, and that the supply chain is, is complex and that we lack a lot of um, important information uh, to really analyze what the best solutions could be. So even though um, the report tries to point out the main strengths or weaknesses of these uh, suggested policy options, the discussion is in inevitably uh, superficial because of the lack of information and probably not exhaustive, which means that further analysis is, is needed in cooperation with all stakeholders before making any decisions on, on, on which uh, policy to adopt. Particularly more information is needed on reactor and, and processor specific production costs, the extent and mechanisms of current government funding, and the magnitude of price increases that will be necessary at each producer to achieve full cost recovery. So with that said, I'll quickly run through um, uh, the policy options. Um, option one uh, suggests a coordinated withdrawal of reactor funding that is attributable to moly production and of a withdrawal that would be phased um, over several years. A phased withdrawal over several years, according to a predetermined schedule, uh, would provide certainty to producers and allow the supply chain uh, to renegotiate contracts and increase prices. Coordination among producer countries could ensure that funding is, not, is discontinued um, uh, in parallel for all reactors and that no single reactor and then processor as a result is at a competitive disadvantage for ha from having its funding uh, cut first. The main strength of this option is it would, would be that it would send clear signals to reactors and, down, and the downstream supply chain that price increases are necessary. Um, and it would also, following an initial transition period, require no direct intervention uh, by governments in the supply chain and leave the adjustment uh, of supply contracts um, and prices to market forces. In terms of disadvantages, it might be difficult to reach consensus among all, produ among all producing countries to commit to such a withdrawal, or even if such commitments are made, um, for countries to honor their commitments. It would also require relatively precise identification of costs related to irradiation, which might be difficult because uh, reactors are um, uh, active in, a vari in, in, in various areas and it might not be easy to isolate um, um, moly production from other uh, activities. The process might also reveal large differences in production costs between individual reactors and as a result uh, shifts in, in market shares and at least in the short run additional instability of supply and prices might not uh, quickly uh, readjust along the entire supply chain. So because option one um, might be associated with additional um, supply instability in the short run, the report also puts forward three measures that could accompany such a withdrawal um, of government funding of, of uh, moly production. 
The first one would be to increase price transparency. This could facilitate a monitoring process where the prices actually increase and move towards full cost recovery. Uh, for example, supply chain participants could confidentially report revenue and volume from past financial periods to an independent party. Uh, these figures could then be aggregated to average, uh, to publish average um, market prices without revealing uh, prices of individual participants. This could facilitate price monitoring and could also create a mechanism of peer pressure among supply chain participants to uh, comply with commitments to full cost recovery. Um, in terms of weaknesses of this, of, of, of this option, um, it would of course not uh, address the underlying barrier that keeps participants from raising prices. It would rely on self-reported data and ultimately on uh, unilateral initiatives by individual supply chain participants to, to raise prices. And more detailed legal, would also be legal review would be necessary of, of this option to ensure that it couldn't be um, abused for unlawful collusion. Another option to uh, accompany uh, a withdrawal of government funding of uh, MOLI production could be a direct price regulation in the supply chain, for instance, in the form of a price floor for irradiation. Um, such a price floor could be introduced temporarily to ensure that reactors can make up for the lost uh, funding, uh, lost government funding uh, from additional revenue. And the floor uh, could subsequently be removed once prices have increased um, uh, to full cost recovery levels and have been established um, in the supply chain. The strength of this option is that it constitutes a very direct means of ensuring that prices are high enough for full cost recovery um, and for the required uh, production capacity uh, to be available. It would also prevent individual processes and reactors to gain an advantage in price competition by making irradiation services available below full cost recovery prices. While the main weaknesses of this option might be that it could be difficult uh, to determine the, the, the appropriate level of a price floor, in particular if the price floor is expected to be uniform across countries, not to distort competition, and a consensus um, has to be reached. A general issue with price floors, of course, is that they make prices unresponsive to demand and supply signals, um, and that they remove or attenuate um, incentives to produce um, efficiently at the lowest possible cost. Finally, although price uh, regulation is quite common in markets for medical products, they usually take the form of price, price ceilings, not price floors. There is little experience uh, with the effects of price floors. Another option um, to make prices um, more uh, transparent would be the introduction of a commodities trading platform for bulk uh, molybdenum at the uh, point of sale between processes uh, to, uh, to generator manufacturers. This would allow processes to sell um, and generator manufacturers to buy at the world market price. Such platforms are quite common for other raw materials such as industrial metals and make prices more responsive to su uh, supply and demand signals, helping to ensure that the appropriate uh, levels of capacity are made available. This would also allow for the trading of derivatives, such as futures contracts, which can serve as signals um, uh, of capacity and help stabilize supply um, in the supply chain. A number of weaknesses of this option, uh, the most important one is that in the current uh, supply chain, a number of uh, individual participants have market power and they would con could continue to exercise market power um, in, uh, if molybdenum were traded on a, on a commodities market. Also compared to some other commodities, um, which are traded in volumes of billions of dollars annually, the um, market for molybdenum is relatively small and might be too small uh, for such a platform uh, to, to, work and, to work effectively. And finally, it would uh, require generators, generator manufacturers to accept delivery of, any, uh, of molybdenum from any processor, which would entail additional licensing cost. Option five is an alternative uh, to uh, the options just presented. Um, governments could, uh, governments of producing countries could continue funding the reactors uh, that uh, um, provide irradiation services, but agree with end-user countries that end-user countries uh, bear the cost. So producing and end-user countries um, in this option could estimate capacity needs and co corresponding budgets uh, jointly, and end-user countries could then uh, fund the budget in proportion uh, to their share of total output consumed. The appeal of this option um, would be that it provides a direct means of making funds available to achieve the desired level of capacity, including outage reserve capacity, 
Um, it could also allow to preserve the historical social contract whereby um, the production of um, medical radioisotopes was tax funded um, for necessary medical services uh, to be available um, while making sure that end user countries um, also bear the cost. Difficulties could uh, include gaining consensus among producing and end user countries on capacity planning and then most importantly on the allocation of budgets and funding. And this might be particularly difficult in countries uh, in which healthcare is funded, is funded from a variety of sources other than, than tax funding, such as social health insurance, uh, private insurance, or patient out-of-pocket uh, spending. In these countries, governments might be reluctant uh, to fund medical products directly uh, from taxation. So examples would be the United States, obviously, but also in countries such as Germany, uh, social health insurance uh, funds a large proportion of total health expenditure. And finally, um, there are options, of course, um, as we've seen at the beginning of the presentation, to sub substitute away from the use of technetium uh, with substitute alternative um, uh, imaging modalities or other um, isotopes and PET scans that would mainly um, uh, have cost implications in terms of current spending because uh, these scans tend to be more expensive and also require the necessary investments in in capital equipment and human resources. And finally, um, a number of uh, projects are on the way to uh, produce technetium from non-reactor sources. Um, this could also be an option, but these also tend, uh, at the current state of play, be more expensive, and uh, currently um, only very little production capacity is available. So with that, um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, our report is available from today. Uh, the link is on here. Um, encourage everybody to take a look. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Martin. Uh, you're doing uh, much of the heavy lifting here today as uh, one of the co-authors of the report and uh, in the absence of uh, Kevin, Kevin Charlton. Uh, let, me, let me give you uh, five minutes to, to catch your breath because we will need you again uh, when, we, uh, when we will actually uh, um, have, the, have the questions uh, and uh, we will count on you uh, not exclusively, but uh, but uh, nevertheless uh, heavily uh, to answer those questions. But uh, in the meantime, I would I would like to present uh, very briefly a complementary, a smaller complementary technical uh, report on uh, on uh, the uh, capacity. Um, it is it is here. It's called uh, the supply of medical radioisotopes but then uh, 2019 medical isotope demand and capacity projections for the next five years for the 2019-2024 period. And uh, pl uh, you see here, and uh, this has been, I think, compiled by, by Kevin pri primarily, uh, how the demand is expected uh, to, to develop uh, over the next five years in, 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 uh, in red. Uh, which is sort of current current demand, and then you have the in green actually the uh, the demand plus a 30 percent uh, outage reserve capacity. Because in the past we had this problem that uh, uh, some reactors were were indeed uh, uh, discontinued or for for technical reasons had to stop for a few months or whatever. So uh, in order to have some sort of uh, visibility and stability in the uh, market for uh, molybdenum-99 and technetium-99, it was assumed safe or it was assumed necessary to have this outage reserve capacity. And in mauve, in, 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 in pink, uh, purple, uh, we have in, indeed uh, current capacity. And there we see if we have uh, the demand as it develops plus the outage reserve capacity, then we'll actually be in a situation by 2024 where current capacity will no longer um, be uh, sufficient to indeed uh, uh, cover the supply with that additional reserve margin. Um, now, we, there, is a, there is a chance, and that, that's uh, the, the message of the, of the uh, next slide, that indeed uh, with new technologies coming on stream, uh, that indeed, uh, this is the highest line there, uh, total capacity might indeed uh, uh, increase. However, these are to some extent uh, the technologies that you mentioned at the very, very end. Alternative technologies uh, that have not yet been tried and tested. So 
um, the basic message of, uh, of that report is um, if you don't do anything, we might get into a crunch by 2024. If we add to that what's currently uh, under, under preparation with sort of untested uh, technologies, we might be on the safe side, but this is a situation that remains not critical, but to some extent fragile. And uh, I, will, I will actually uh, uh, resume that uh, report with, uh, with the main messages that uh, many of these problems have been solved and a range of alternative production technologies have been demonstrated at this demonstration phase, not yet at, uh, at the continuous industrial uh, production. Um, a number of actions have been taken to, uh, to stabilize the existing supply chain. And uh, some of that has been coordinated by an organization here in, in Europe, which is called the Nuclear Medicine Europe Organization, um, but with whom I understand you have been cooperating or exchanging uh, information. But uh, uh, a number of challenges remain. Uh, since November 2017, uh, supply, for instance, has been under pressure or stressed uh, due to an unplanned outage at uh, NTP in uh, South Africa. And uh, the NMEU team, the uh, Nuclear Medicine Europe team, had to convene almost weekly during 2018 to continue to monitor the situation closely. That's what I uh, said earlier. Uh, the situation is not critical at the moment, but it remains fragile and needs to be uh, indeed uh, supervised closely. Um, that will perhaps at the very end of the presentation uh, um, uh, lead us to ask a little bit, uh, what about the future of this sort of, sort of watching brief on uh, the supply and demand situation and perhaps also of the role of NEA and OECD together with a high-level group or some successor thereof uh, during, during the next uh, few years. That is already all I had to say on this uh, brief, uh, brief capacity report, which of course is also on the web and you're very much invited uh, to uh, download it and have a closer look. Uh, the report itself is much, much richer than what I was capable of presenting here uh, due to the shortness of time. Given that, uh, the presentations are done and uh, we will actually be moving to the uh, question, question phase, questions uh, that uh, we have, questions that uh, have been uh, perhaps sent in by, by the general uh, pub public and also by uh, the public here present, present with us. Um, I would like to ask one question to you, uh, uh, Martin. Um, this is a very, very complex market. You, you uh, spelled it out very, very well. Uh, I also understand that one of the big, big challenges is uh, that uh, uh, both uh, molybdenum 99 and technetium 99 are not storable. Um, uh, molybdenum 99 has a half-life of uh, 66 hours, if I understand correctly, and technetium uh, only of uh, six hours. That's very, very short. It has to get from that time from, uh, from the uh, generators and the processors to the, uh, to the patients, to the healthcare providers. So it's a fairly, fairly uh, uh, unique situation. Are there any other markets uh, from which you could have sort of taking experience, which you have looked at, how did they solve the problem? Uh, for instance, also this uh, question of the outage reserve capacity. Do you have any, any uh, uh, pointers where to look for possible solution for these questions? So I think um, the, <laughs> the short and, and simple answer is that the, the market is quite unique. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and we clearly haven't found, although that was one of the goals of our work, or okay. one of the specific requests of the high-level group, was to find other markets that could serve as, as, as analogies. Um, we've tried. We haven't found another one that is quite as complex and that combines all these problems, um, uh, some of which you've, you've outlined. Now, there is a short section in, in, in the last chapter of our report that tries to propose um, possible solutions that looks at other markets. 
We've tried to look at uh, uh, the, mar the pharmaceutical market in general. We've tried to look at uh, uh, markets specifically uh, for uh, medicines used in hospitals uh, where there is a similar uh, supply chain dynamic in that prices are generally not regulated, but hospitals individually uh, negotiate prices with, with um, uh, suppliers. But the price dynamics tend to be very, very different. Usually what happens is that a new product comes to market and during the in initial period of, of market exclusivity or patent protection, the supplier enjoys uh, market power and, and any policy tries to uh, manage that market power. Um, other markets that we try to look at are energy markets where there is this problem of, of uh, not being able to store uh, the product. In particularly electricity, uh, we also uh, briefly try to uh, look at, at district heating uh, uh, markets. But again, um, there are lessons here and there. Um, one has to take them for what they're worth and, and then combine them into, into the, the market for uh, medical radioisotopes. Uh, where there are a lo lot of uh, challenges in parallel um, that aren't present in these other markets. I think electricity, however, is interesting because of the problem of outage reserve capacity, which means that there has to be a constant margin of, of, of capacity that isn't, in most cases, actually used. Mm -hmm. And electricity markets um, um, employ uh, uh, various mechanisms uh, to make that capacity available, but they typically separate uh, capacity uh, from the core market of the product. And this could be something um, that, specifically talking about outage reserve capacity in, in molybdenum production, that could be of interest uh, to, to this supply chain. Definitely. I was uh, also also struck by, by uh, the potential similarity with electricity markets, uh, which is something I've been uh, working on uh, quite, quite extensively, and that uh, the question of uh, capacity financing might be something to even delve deeper in in the future, definitely. Just just one little point. It's not actually answering your question in saying where is there a commonality of of experience in a different market, but commonality of policy response. There are some analogies, uh, in particular in the pharmaceutical market. There's a lot of interest at the moment in trying to make the pharmaceutical market more transparent and to understand what the costs are where the pricing comes from, uh, so that payers in particular can feel a little bit more confident that they're getting value for money. And so w when we start talking about more price transparency, it's very much in the mood of the time, shall we say, in terms of what's happening in the, the health sector to start talking about that. That might actually open some possibilities in the, the, the price transparency right. approach. Uh, I've, uh, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, Martin mentioned that uh, indeed the market for uh, medical radioisotopes was about, I don't know, 630 million per, per year, which, which sounds like a, like a large amount. But uh, sort of for, for the health sector, which is of course much bigger than that, is that sort of a, a financially speaking, commercially speaking, is that a big issue or is that really sort of a, a minor uh, uh, sort of part of, of, of total expenses? Um, so total health spending in OECD countries is what? It's round about uh, $6.5 trillion. So in terms of the total amount, uh, no, it, obviously it, it's a small amount. That doesn't mean that anybody's going to be happy to see about costs going up. So I mean, there'll always be resistance from the point of view of providers when you start telling them that they have to pay a higher price. But in the grand scheme of things, no, we are really are talking about very small amounts of money, even though 630 million, yeah, sure, that sounds like a lot. Yeah. Maybe I can add to that, uh, also just to give an order of magnitude, the global market for for prescription medicines is estimated to be worth about 1.2 uh, trillion Trillions. dollars exactly. So it's 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 definitely uh, much bigger numbers, and the global market for medical devices is about um, 500 billion, um, if 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 my memory serves me right. But and I think I mean these numbers are important uh, reference points to to have in mind because uh, for one, uh, this might be one of the reasons. Um, why from a, from a healthcare system perspective, this is not at the top um, of priorities uh, because it's usually the big spending items that attract attention and, and, and not something small. 
And it also, of course, um, uh, raises a question on, on what kind of policies might function. Because if we talk about a market uh, at the irradiation step that is worth $60 million a year, there is only so much that can be done in terms of creating incentives for commercial players to, 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 to enter the market. So I think these numbers um, need to be kept in mind um, in, in, in further discussions. Uh, absolutely, and, uh, and I'm glad that we sort of got the orders of magnitude right. Um, the, the question is, what is the, what is the lesson that you draw from it? I mean, uh, sort of implicitly in your report that completely chimes with what uh, you've been saying, it was sort of said the amount to sort of move towards full cost recovery would only be really marginal for the, uh, for the uh, uh, medical sector. And, uh, and that's confirmed by what you say. Uh, the question is then, indeed, how well can you organize a rather small market for 60 million? Or is it not sort of simpler that just somebody steps forward, puts the money on the table, and says, uh, uh, bo uh, a problem solved. Uh, yeah. I, I guess the question is who who, who that somebody <laughs> might be. <yeah? laughs> but but I think I think that's also the reason why why um, we wanted to present option five in the report to say uh, this is a market that is incredibly complex. There are barriers that it's it's as far from from a perfect textbook um, market a, a perfectly competitive textbook market as it as it could be. And perhaps government funding is the simplest solution to, to ensure that capacity is, is available. Now the question of course is why, why would governments in Australia, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands um, and South Africa fund healthcare in the United States and elsewhere, right? So this is where the tension comes in and, 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 and where a, a conversation might have to be had about um, who ends up uh, bearing the cost if this is a solution that governments want to, want to adopt, of course. However, it also underlines the importance of organizations such as ours, OECD, NEA, in order to put uh, um, governments into contact to, to, to sort these, uh, these questions uh, out. Um, I have received uh, a, a question through the, uh, through the internet um, by Mr. Dan Wolf of the UK Nuclear Innovation and Research Office. And uh, he asked a question, um, have you considered non-reactor production of molybdenum-99 or TC-99M directly? Um, I think that was a little bit the, the, your last point, but uh, please, please uh, elaborate. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure what is meant by, by considered directly, but, but certainly, I mean, this is, this is something that, that we've, uh, we cover in the report. I, I, I think the main caveat, you, you pointed it out already, is that uh, most of these projects are still in a development stage. Um, if I recall correctly from chapter four of our report, uh, currently 5% um, of the global uh, demand could be uh, or, or, or is supplied uh, 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 by capacity from uh, non-reactor uh, production methods. So, so this is something, yes, that, that is an option. It's something that we've considered, but it, it appears to be um, uh, still relatively far uh, from um, being able to replace uh, current sources from, okay. from uh, high, high enriched uranium. Okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a second question indeed uh, here, which is, which is more factual. Uh, does the full cost recovery include any of the initial capital investment costs of a new facility or just operating costs? I imagine these are the, the annual fixed uh, operating costs of keeping a reactor open. Uh, we had some exchanges in the run-up to this uh, seminar and uh, if you, um, of this webinar, and if I may, I may uh, resume what I remember, but correct me if it's not correct. Then I think the uh, definition of full cost recovery in this report does indeed include all expenditures for capital costs, including the original investment costs. That, 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 that's correct. With, with, of course, the methods of how exactly to ac allocate costs being uh, a bit of a, a matter of debate, as it always is uh, when allocating uh, uh, fixed costs to, to uh, variable production costs. Right. Thank you. Yes, one one uh, uh, further qu uh, question I have uh, here is, uh, is looking a little bit more in the, in the future. 
apparently, a, a number of new medical radioisotopes uh, are being used more and more frequently for new medical treatments. These are not substitutes for molybdenum 99 or technetium 99, uh, uh, but uh, uh, new and, uh, and uh, 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 researched uh, methods to uh, additional methods. And if you would sort of uh, try to uh, design a, a new market or, or try to sort of give advice on these people who are developing those, uh, uh, those techniques, uh, what, what would you possibly, what advice could you possibly give them based on the experience that we now have for the uh, molybdenum 99, technetium 99 market? Are there any lessons sort of to, to be passed on to people? Yeah, that's a difficult question, of course, but um, per perhaps perhaps this, I would say the single most important thing to consider, even though it, it sounds obvious, is that there are no not a lot of mechanisms in, in how um, healthcare systems operate that make price increases easy. Mm -hmm. it, it tends to be um, designed to give incent either give incentives to, to, to healthcare providers to use res resources efficiently, as we've seen. Um, providers tend to be paid uh, for a certain procedure, a certain service, or they're paid for an entire treatment episode, and then it's up to them um, to manage costs within them and, and within that, and they have an incentive uh, uh, to, to, to contain costs. Um, if we look at prescri prescription medicines that are perhaps slightly different because uh, they tend to be uh, paid for directly by healthcare uh, uh, payers and, and not necessarily th uh, through healthcare providers. Uh, again, price regulation uh, tr usually takes the form of either a, a, a hard price ceiling or some kind of maximum uh, a payment that a, a healthcare payer makes with the remainder then paid by, by the patient out of pocket or by a complement insurance scheme or, or, or something of that sort. Uh, so the point being that the way health financing is designed um, has, a, uh, in many cases, a built-in cost containment mechanisms. And once prices are established in the market, it's very difficult, as uh, people in, in, in the molybdenum and, and technetium supply chain uh, can tell you from, from 10 years of work of the high-level group, it's very difficult to increase prices. So perhaps one, one uh, lesson to learn as new products come to market is that there is one opportunity to set prices at the right level, and this is when the technology is introduced, not uh, uh, later in the process. So uh, set, uh, set the prices uh, sufficiently higher right from the beginning. Later on, it will be very difficult to, uh, to do so. That's a very, very interesting point. Uh, if, I, if I may sort of, in the, in the, in the general context, uh, uh, sort of uh, ask, you had the fee-for-service uh, model, and the other was the DLG, um, the uh, DRG, 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 DRG. Yeah. DR, DRG model, where, where you had sort of a, a longer term procedure for, for sort of a particular medical uh, situation. In general, and the, here I'm going a little bit beyond the uh, molybdenum 99, technetium 99 market. In general, on, on economic uh, grounds, what is sort of the, the model that the, the OECD? Uh, health, uh, health Directorate, Health Division, uh, would sort of try to push uh, uh, um, uh, medical systems? Um, uh, or do you say the two are complementary and we just have different things that, that work differently for, for different, uh, different uh, products? Yeah, I think that is a question that, that we've heard before. Uh, th there is no answer. <laughs> it's, it, it depends on, on the situation. Uh, Fee-for-service fee is often criticized uh, that it, of course, incentivizes to provide additional services yeah. because with every, usually there is a profit margin included and with every additional service, the healthcare provider uh, makes additional money and, 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 and there have been scenarios where this leads to, to over-provision or, or, or inappropriate uh, provision. But it's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, certainly fee-for-service diagnosis-related groups, DRGs or global budgets are not um, s alternatives or, or, or substitutes for each other. They are appropriate in certain situations depending on what kind of behavior uh, one wants to incentivize. Um, and, and they also depend 
um, on on the ability of, of provider organizations to bear financial risks. Nobody would uh, want to fund an office-based uh, physician, for instance, uh, on, on using a, an annual budget mm -hmm. uh, that would create incentives that would probably um, lead to behavior that is not uh, uh, desirable. Yeah. Yeah. I, think I, I mean, just to, to supplement that, because Martin is absolutely right. Uh, I mean, this is not a normal pr market. This is not a market for cars or something where you have fairly transparent knowledge about what you're buying, both from the buyer and the seller. You don't have insurance involved in terms of you're not actually paying, somebody else is paying. All sorts of reasons why the health market can't be treated in the same way as if you're talking about going down to the local shop and buying a, a bottle of milk or something. It doesn't quite work like that. And that means that there is no ideal way of pricing. The best advice that we always give to countries is, what are you trying to do with your pricing system? What's your problem? If, you, if you're thinking about your pricing system, about how you pay for health services, what is it that you're wanting to change? And don't try and design the perfect system. Just try and change your current system to solve the problem that you've got. And of course, this is a classic example where this particular case fits with that. There, there is nothing wrong with saying, overall, we want a DRG-based uh, system for paying for hospitals because we think that's the best way of building in cost controls. But we might also want fee-for-service for some aspects such as, for example, um, the nuclear radioisotopes. It's a possibility. And there's lots of little fixes like that that appear in the health system. So it's perfectly plausible to think through um, examples like that. The trouble is that there won't be the same fix for each country because every country has a slightly different set of problems, which is why I don't think looking for a single solution to this issue is ever likely to work. It's going to be a discussion maybe within regions, maybe a monster, in, within individual countries to work out in this country what's the best way that we can respond to this need in order to move to full, towards full cost recovery. Uh, yes, I, I guess it's a little bit of a of, uh, how shall I say, an, a tightrope walk between uh, sort of uh, paying attention to the specificities of the individual country and international coordination, which also seems to be uh, necessary. Um, we, uh, we have another question here, actually, uh, coming from, uh, f from, the, from the web. And uh, it, is, uh, it is actually uh, going rather, rather deep into the uh, technicalities of the uh, of the uh, economics, but I'll pose it nevertheless. And if we if we need to say, uh, they should uh, then send an email uh, so that Kevin can perhaps uh, respond. Uh, then we'll then we'll do that. But uh, we'll we'll mention it. And uh, it is here. Uh, do you have a view on the margins across the value chain to better understand if there are asymmetries in the value chain? You 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 presented that that long value chain, and. Uh, and in particular with the key role of the processors and the generators. And uh, do you have any idea, any indication, any possible indication on the margins across that value chain? Uh, so the answer is quite simple. No, we don't. Um, okay. Certainly, I don't. Uh, uh, so Kevin has been uh, doing the structural analysis. He built a, a market model. But um, uh, even even in that market model, um, if I recall correctly, uh, we're not able. We, he was not able to to estimate margins. Uh, that would be confidential information. Uh, sh yes, but but that gets me to a to a second uh, to a second question. We we talked um, at least uh, in in sort of uh, in outline uh, the role of governments in the funding of the research reactors, the role of the medical sector with a, with a certain fee structure. Uh, is there a specific role? Uh, a specific measure that could be taken by the processors and by the generators to sort of uh, make the market more transparent, make it work better, also secure, of course, their business models in the long term? Or are they sort of just uh, in there uh, 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 doing, doing their business, trying to sort of uh, 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 navigate between, on the one hand, the reactors, and on the other hand, the medical service? Or are they actually active players? So, so I think I think uh, there is a need for more transparency, uh, especially, I mean, e e even for for the nuclear research reactor step of the supply chain or the process step of the supply chain, where government funding continues to play a role, 
um, there is very limited information available on, on, on how much that actually represents in the overall revenue structure of, this, of these organizations, um, what mechanisms are used uh, to fund these organizations. Um, so I think along the supply chain, greater transparency to understand what exactly is going on, what the financial flows are, is absolutely essential. I wouldn't think that uh, there would be a role of individual uh, players to, to increase transparency. I mean, they've, you know, they've, to a certain extent, especially the, the generator manufacturers are, are, are private businesses. And, 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 and then there's this question of uh, you know, what effects uh, does price transparency uh, have on competition? Uh, when does it start constituting collusion? So there are all, all these tricky questions along, along the way. Um, and, and, and that's why, uh, in, in my view, uh, there would be a need for uh, an outside party, so, so, some, something like uh, the high-level group, uh, the Nuclear Energy Agency, the OECD, um, whatever, that, that, uh, whatever organization that may be, mm -hmm. to work towards greater transparency, okay. ensuring that it uh, does not lead to some of these um, uh, side effects that we need to avoid. Thank you very much. You're, you're actually moving towards uh, the, the very last part of our webinar, uh, which is a little bit sort of the outlook for the future and the summary uh, of the implications of the, of the report. Uh, I will ask Mark perhaps uh, first. Mark, uh, could you provide a brief conclusion, uh, providing perhaps a perspective on what the future might bring, both in terms of the supply of medical radioisotopes and its continuing study by the OECD, ELS, and, and NEA. Much will depend, of course, on our member countries and the extent to which they wish to continue funding this activity. But from your vantage point, could you provide sort of a little bit of an outlook on that? Uh, okay, well, let me, let me start just by going back to the basics. I mean, when we said at the beginning that there's 30 million scans performed each year using uh, radioactive medical isotopes, uh, that's 30 million people who are being diagnosed as having some disease that can be, that then be treated, or else being reassured that they don't have some disease. Uh, the, the, the benefits that we get from having a stable, reliable supply of these uh, radioactive isotopes is absolutely enormous in the health sector. I mean, the, the well-being, the reassurance that people get, the ability to actually treat diseases. So one way or the other, we need to make sure that we don't put that at risk. And that, that's what's been so great, of course, about the, uh, the high-level group that the, the NEA has had in place for these so many years now. And we're very happy to continue to, to uh, support that at the OECD because, of course, it's the health systems that benefit so, so much from having a stable supply um, available. Now, I, th I think what we've seen from this report is that, in many respects, it's it's a small issue financially, but it's a very complex issue to solve. And so it's not something that I think is going to be um, something that we're just going to wave a magic wand and just say we change the, pay the payment system in health systems and suddenly we find the way to solve this problem. It, it won't work like that. But equally, it's not such a big problem that we can't actually make progress together. And, you know, we've, we've seen... Uh, the new sources of supply coming on online. Maybe we've seen that the fact that there's greater discussion about transparency of prices in the health sector, which might have an influence on the solutions. So that there are things happening which I think we just need to keep monitoring and working out how we exploit these events in order to move towards solutions uh, to ensure a more stable supply in future. And I think, as I said at the beginning, I don't think that's necessarily a single solution. It, it might be. It, it's possible that we could agree on a general principle, but it may well be just small steps that we take in different regions that we can use to make, to make progress. And certainly from the OECD's point of view, we'd be delighted to continue to work with the NEA on these issues. Great. That's uh, very good to hear. Uh, Martin, I give you the, the, final, the final word. Uh, you started uh, sort of saying that perhaps uh, a group such as the high-level group uh, might continue to play a useful role in the future. Any, any other um, concluding uh, remarks, statements? I think, I think uh, the most important things have been said. Uh, I maybe just reiterate that I think with, uh, it's, it's, it's been, we've, in, we've enjoyed the cooperation with the NEA and, and 
Um, it seems to me that uh, the contribution that this report is making is that it has brought the health, the, the health system perspective into the picture, which um, uh, in, in, in 10 years work, worth of work by the high-level group that has been very successful in, in many ways was always uh, a part of the story that was missing. So I think uh, this cooperation, this report um, has allowed us to take a great step forward, uh, to complete the picture, to understand better um, how the supply chain works, uh, what the issues are, and, 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 and where we could start looking for uh, possible solutions. Uh, but the work is not done yet, and um, this is where uh, future, future work has to, has to come in. Very good. Let me just say in conclusion that also the NEA enjoyed very much working together with you, with the OEC ELS, and uh, if the member countries so want, would be delighted to continue to do so. Uh, thank you very much. This concludes our webinar on the supply of medical isotopes and economic diagnosis and possible solutions. Thank you very much for your participation and interest. Thank you again to all our speakers for their presentations and to all of you who've participated in today's webinar. We'd like to remind you that all the reports mentioned today can be downloaded from the NEA website at www.oecd-nea.org. The supply of medical isotopes and economic diagnosis and possible solutions is also available on the OECD website at www.oecd.org. For more updates and news, we also encourage you to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on LinkedIn. Thank you. We can make noise. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Never know when these things finish. Anyway.